so I watched him give that uh, lunar module uh, descent film talk a few times. <laughs> and one time, uh, he was talking about the landing and on the, the, uh, the Google Moon version, you can see the descent stage right there. And so he goes, and I'm going to land right there. He points at the, uh, at the stage. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my honor to be here with you tonight. Uh, as you know, the primary mission of the uh, Astronaut Scholarship Foundation is, is supporting scholars in the STEM fields. And I probably don't have to say what those initials stand for, but they are science, technology, engineering, and math. My own interest in STEM goes back to my childhood. Although I must confess, back then it was more, I was more interested in the S and the T, and, and not as much as the E and the M. Uh, having a dad who was an astronaut may have had something to do with my, uh, my STEM interests. But there was a, a particular memory that I have that had a major impact on this as well. I was about 10 years old. I was doing a uh, jigsaw puzzle in our living room and dad comes up and says, hey, do you want to see a one-sided object? I thought about that for a few minutes and came back with, uh, that's a trick question. That's not possible. And then I went back to putting my puzzle together. Dad shows up with a sheet of notebook paper, some scissors, some tape, and a pencil. Uh, scratching my head just like I was right then. <laughs> uh, he cuts about a three inch strip of, of paper and he gives it a twi half twist and he tapes it up. He gives me the pencil. He says, I want you to draw a line. Don't take your pencil off the paper. See what happens. So he gave it to me. I started drawing and lo and behold, came back where I started. One single line. He said, see, there's only one side. That's called a Mobius strip. I examined it for a while, <laughs> trying to reconcile what I thought was impossible with what I thought was holding in my hand. Couldn't really do it, but looking back, it was a, a, a transformational experience for me. And uh, it began a lifelong, a lifelong fascination with the really cool things, which are often found in the S and the T. And, and definitely the E, once you can appreciate it. And probably the M, too, although that was never really my thing. <laughs> The Neil Armstrong Award of Excellence hopes to capture that same spirit, to acknowledge an astronaut scholar alum who has done amazing work. I'd like to take this moment to thank the judges for the very difficult job of choosing an award winner from a collection of very impressive entries. As you may know, our award winner this year is Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones, a PhD, is a chemical engineer, inventor, and entrepreneur. Jones is a CEO and co-founder of CARBA and founder of Activated Research Company, or ARC. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with a degree in chemical engineering and chemistry in 2009. He went on to receive a PhD in chemical engineering with a focus on heterogeneous catalysts from UC Berkeley, which as a Stanford guy is my only really complaint with Andrew. <laughs> And he currently holds four patents. Jones received the astronaut scholarship in 2007 while attending the University of Minnesota in recognition of his research on the catalytic fast pyrolysis of biomass. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you the 2023 Neil Armstrong Award of Excellence recipient, Andrew Jones.
Wow, I'm not sure how I'm gonna explain this to TSA. Uh, I'm gonna get that through. Well, thank you all so much for having me. This is an incredible honor. Um, Neil Armstrong, shoes I will never fill, to be honest, but to be mentioned in the same sentence is truly an honor and a dream come true for me. So thank you guys so much. Thank you to the Armstrong family for making this possible. Uh, it's a special day for me, a special day for all of you scholars. I had the privilege over the last couple of days to meet so many of you and to see your technical presentations. And I have to say, wow, you guys nailed it. The depth of research that you're doing, a lot of you in undergrad, the diversity of topics you're studying from cancer research to cardiovascular to robots to space and the origins of the universe to biofuels, incredible. Um, I was told to give you guys a word of advice and uh, I'm, I'm still pretty young, right? But uh, if I had to give you guys an, a word of advice, it would be to think big and to think even bigger um, because you guys are it. There's no one else, right? Let's, let's think about this for a second. You guys are in the greatest nation in the world. You guys are the top, yeah? <laughs> you guys are at the top of your class. You're at the best schools in the world and you're doing STEM, right? So you guys are the ones that are gonna change the world. If not you, then who? There's no one else. Uh, so go out there, keep up this work, think bigger. Uh, I learned that in my first company, I gotta think bigger. Uh, so today I really wanna talk to you about my journey and how the scholarship has helped me and why I decided to work on something as crazy as climate change. Uh, so I wanna start with a couple of questions here um, and I'm gonna turn on this microphone. Yep, yeah I got the switch on. So um, I wanna get a show of hands. This is gonna be an interactive presentation, so get ready. Um, and actually, before I do that, I need you guys to take a drink so, uh, to help me out. <laughs> so I want you all to toast to the scholars, uh, all 68 of them. Raise your glasses, take a big swig. It'll make the talk easier. Um, so to all the scholars and everything you're gonna do uh, in the future, cheers. Okay, and now I need a show of hands. How many of you have heard of climate change? <laughs> okay, yeah, you've maybe heard of it. Okay, um, how many of you wanna learn more about climate change? Okay, a lot of them. How many of you are sick of hearing about climate change? <laughs> right? Yes, I am too. Uh, I have to admit it, I work on climate change. I'm sick of hearing about it. We've been talking about it for decades, right? Even back into the 80s with OPEC crisis, and not much has been done. Uh, so why am I up here? Why am I talking about this? Uh, what's the reason? Well, the reason is we have a new technology that can solve this, and in the next 20 minutes, I hope to convince you of that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so first, some inspiration. We can store carbon dioxide underground for millions of years in the form of a solid, and we know this because we've dug up ancient carbon dioxide, 300 million years old, in the form of coal and we burned it and put that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, right? Trillions of tons of it. We can use technology today to repeat that process in reverse and here's an example of that. So this is uh, from my company. So this is solid carbon right here and this solid carbon came from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere a couple of years ago above Minneapolis Twin Cities. We converted it to the solid carbon and we're gonna bury it underground where it will be stable for millions of years. The even more exciting thing, if you wanna put the slides back up, is that the organizers of this event have taken action to make this event carbon neutral. So working with CARBA, we are going to bury an equivalent amount, 467 or 476 pounds of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent to the emissions of 553 kilowatt hours in the state of Florida with your emissions profile. And that equals 16 cubic feet of this solid carbon. We can put that underground, we can bury it, and we can completely offset this entire event. And we can repeat this process again and again and again and uh, remove the legacy carbon that's in the atmosphere. That's pretty cool, right? So thank you to the organizers for doing that. So 
So to understand how this works, uh, I really need to go back to how we started Carba. And the story of Carba starts with Paul and I. Paul and I have devoted our lives, we're chemical engineers, and we've devoted our lives to chemistry, chemicals, energy, and fuels. Uh, we actually started working on the idea of Carba that we could remove billions of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere about two and a half years ago after admittedly seeing the Elon Musk X Prize for carbon capture and really saw that this was, this was starting to take off. So there's a, a video that I don't think is playing there, but um, Paul and I, and I think the titles are not on there, but that's okay. Paul and I actually met back in 2005 at the University of Minnesota and it's a really cool story. This guy in the bottom right, Professor Lanny Schmidt, he was a really charismatic guy. He was this kind of small stature, had a humpback, and was one of the first pioneers in sustainable chemistry. And he was giving this talk about how he could convert plants and biomass into hydrogen and fuels and the building blocks of plastics. And this mesmerized me. He showed this video here, which unfortunately, oh, there it is. Okay, sweet. Thank you, guys. Um, it was this piece of cellulose, piece of wood, dropping onto a very hot rhodium catalyst and vaporizing in millisecond time frames. And that was creating these gases of hydrogen and fuels and, and whatnot. And I thought this was alchemy. And as a freshman who literally knew nothing, I went up after this freshman seminar to Lanny Schmidt and I said, I need to learn more about this. I want to work in your lab. I'll work for free. Can I join? And he said, sure, you got a job. You start Monday. And so I went uh, on Monday, I went into the lab and that's where I met Paul Downauer. He was a graduate student at the time and this was the video he took with a high speed camera to get these millisecond fast pyrolysis timeframes. Paul's gone on to do amazing things. He's a distinguished professor at the University of Minnesota. He's had five spin-off companies that are making soaps and plastics from biomass. Uh, and he's also a distinguished MacArthur Genius Fellow. Um, so I've just had the privilege of, of knowing him through the years and we've stayed in touch. About two years after that, I continued my work in the lab and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation recognized that work. And Al Warden flew out to the University of Minnesota to present the largest check I've ever seen in my life. Um, amazing, I understand they don't do these checks anymore, but that was awesome. And two really cool things happened because of that. Um, first, that picture wound up in the newspaper in Minnesota, and a local businessman by the name of Brad Cleveland saw it, and he was part of the mentorship program at the U, and he said, I want to mentor someone like that. And he actually reached out to the university, John Stavig, and he said, I want to mentor that, a guy like that. And John reached out to me and said, hey, this guy wants to mentor you. Do you want to be mentored? And I was like, yes, of course. Um, and so we kicked off a relationship that wound up leading to starting my first company back in 2014, which was Activated Research Company. We both had like minds with renewable energy, and we started a company to do detectors and analytical equipment for measuring greenhouse gases. Uh, sustainable fuels, it's used by National Renewable Energy Laboratory, BASF, Dow, the world over. Um, and so that's been incredibly fun. The second thing that the scholarship did is it gave me confidence. Uh, it was more than just the money, right? The, the money was great. Uh, but the confidence that it gave me that I was being recognized by someone else for what I was doing and that what I was doing was important and that I could continue to do this um, that I was somehow, you know, some special, right? Um, it gave me that further resolve to go to grad school, continue this research, and, and try to change the world. So I encourage all of you, you guys are equally special, do that, um, go out there, change the world. Um, and I can speak from firsthand experience, this, this scholarship stays with you. It's unlike any other scholarship. A huge part of that is this, this community, and, and they've done an even better job now um, keeping that community together. So. Uh, it's just such a great experience. I ended up going to UC Berkeley to get a PhD studying with one of the best in heterogeneous catalysis, focused on sustainable fuels again, and then started that company, and then about two and a half years ago started uh, Carba. So I, I started working on climate change not just because of the terrifying news media and pictures that we've seen. We've all seen the forest fires in Maui and the flooding and hurricanes here in Florida but also because this is the biggest opportunity of our lifetime. 
And by that, I mean there's trillions of dollars flowing into this, uh, into climate tech and, and, and climate. And I want to be a part of the solution to that. Now, the problem is simple. Temperatures are rising. This is data, indisputable data from NASA. And you can see in the early 1900s, it's pretty stable. This is a cool rotary plot. Um, as we get closer to the 2000s and into 2023, it starts to exponentially increase. Um, and as you can see, we're getting past the one degree C warming point um, and up to some pretty dangerous levels. That rise in temperature is followed with a concomitant increase in carbon dioxide, also indisputable. Um, and it's pretty clear that this carbon dioxide is from us burning a lot of fossil fuels. Um, and it's also very clear that that CO2 is causing the warming or a large factor um, of that warming. And the reason for that is the so-called greenhouse effect. Um, the greenhouse effect is very simple to explain. It's essentially solar energy, all its wavelengths hit the Earth and then they radiate back out as infrared energy back into space. Some of that infrared energy is absorbed by carbon dioxide. And because of the sheer volume of CO2 that we've released and its incredible ability to absorb infrared radiation, this causes quite a bit of warming in the planet. And this was actually predicted by a brilliant scientist by the name of Arrhenius. You may recognize his name for the Arrhenius rate equation. In 1896, he did the painstaking calculations to predict this. And it's rumored that he did these calculations uh, as some sort of therapy after his wife left him. <laughs> I, I don't think that's what I would be doing if my wife left me. <laughs> but it was a different time. He didn't have Netflix. <laughs> the, the, the scary thing is what will happen if, if these temperature increases hap continue unabated. Um, and, and this is sort of the, the doom and gloom of the talk, and this is not a doom and gloom talk. But what can happen if we don't do anything, um, and we have a very short window here, uh, is ocean acidification and loss of corals, bleaching of corals, it's already happening. Mass extinctions, especially along the equator. Sea levels that could rise six and a half feet by 2100. It's not good for Florida. Larger, more frequent hurricanes, more droughts and heat waves, more wildfires, changes in rain patterns, loss of agricultural land, increased spread of diseases, and all the war and famine that might come along with these. So very scary, right? And the data is unequivocal, and the time frame is now to act, and that's a closing window. So we, we need to act. The good news is, again, I said this is not a doom and gloom, the good news is we know what to do. The National Academies of Sciences, the IPCC, have created a plan for how to fix this and prevent warming below two degrees, C, uh, two degrees Celsius. And if we can do that, we can somehow prevent the worst effects of climate change. And to do that, we only need to do two things, right? Just two simple things. It's an easy plan. We just stop using fossil fuels, switch to clean energy as much as possible, and we remove the trillion tons of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. And to give you an idea of that scale, a trillion tons of CO2, if you were to compress it and liquefy it, is the volume of Lake Erie. <laughs> that's a lot of stuff to pull out and move, right? So it's, it is, it's a simple plan, but it's a very difficult plan. Um, so on the fossil fuel side, we know how to do this. We have wind, we have solar that's very cheap with the SunShot program. We have nuclear. There are barriers to getting these things implemented, but we know how to do that technically. On the removing the CO2 side, there's less solutions that kind of make sense yet. And so that's what I want to focus this talk on, and that's what I've focused the last two and a half years and, and really most of my life on. So there's a number of different technologies for how to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I don't have time to go into all of these today, because uh, I only have 20 minutes. But they range from things like planting trees, which is a temporary removal of CO2, to things like making rocks, calcium carbonate, or using a large vacuum and sucking CO2 out of the air, using adsorbents, pumping it underground into geological wells. The problem with all of these is that they're crazy expensive. Um, they range from $200 to $1,600 per ton of CO2. The social cost of CO2 is estimated at $180 per ton of CO2. Don't ask me how they get to that number um, or how much I trust it. 
these are a lot. Um, and direct air capture is $700 per ton. That's what your government is putting three and a half billion dollars into these DAC hubs. That's the adsorption process and pumping it underground. They think that might get down to $300 per ton in, by 2030. Still way too expensive, right? And that's all your taxpayer money going towards that. So again, I, we're going to try an experiment here. If you can take out your phones, is there a way to hide the little trust box? Um, this may or may not work. This is a survey. If you can all take out your phones and go to minty.com, maybe someone can tell me what the code is on the top. And Minty is M-E-N-T-I. Oops. You want me to go back? Any way to? All right, well, if that doesn't work, we can, we can do this by a show of hands. So. I don't know what the code is off the top of my head. Is it? No, it's not. Is it really? <laughs> okay, let's do this by a show of hands. All right, how many of you, so I, I want to get an understanding of how much you would pay to offset your carbon. Um, and we're, we're talking about a gallon of gasoline here. So let's start, everyone raise their hand. Uh, with nothing, you know, I'm not going to pay anything, right? Um, you, you can keep your hand up for this and then we'll just put them down as we get to higher and higher levels, all right? So I'm not going to pay anything. I'd pay 10 cents per gallon. I'd pay, yeah, you pay 10 cents per gallon? Okay, decent number. I'd pay 50, up to 50 cents per gallon. That's kind of like a bidding, right? I'd pay a dollar per gallon. Anyone? Ooh, wow, still a lot. I'd pay $2 per gallon. Come on. Okay, I'd pay five dollars per gallon to offset my carbon. Yeah, no, no, no one's gonna do that. Oh, some people. I'd pay ten dollars per gallon. I wish I had an auction voice for this. Okay, so I look like most people started to drop off around one or two dollars per gallon. You guys are a, a wealthy group. That's that's good. Um, if you look at what these would cost per gallon, because a gallon's about eight point eight pounds, I believe of CO2, it ends up being about $6 per gallon for DAC today, down to about $1.70 for biochar and enhanced weathering, and some of those are kind of temporary. So you can see we need to get the cost down, and so how can we decrease the costs to make it more amenable to the rest of the world, um, and then scale this to billions of tons or trillions of tons, uh, which is what we need to get to. Well, luckily, nature has given us the best CO2 direct air capture machines. These are plants and trees. So plants and trees breathe in carbon dioxide and they use solar energy to fix that CO2 into carbohydrates and lignin, the structure of the plants. They also self-replicate and grow without human intervention. And I think they're beautiful. The only problem with them is that they die or they burn down or disease gets them. And when that happens, they re-release all of that CO2 and methane back into the atmosphere. And if they anaerobically decompose, it's up to 50% of that carbon is methane. Um, so it can be even worse. What CARBA can do is stop this process at that critical moment of decay. And we can take those plants and process them into this charcoal to prevent that decay and capture up to 60 to 80% of that carbon and prevent it from re-releasing into the atmosphere. So this looks something like this. And uh, so I'm going to walk you through this process. So we take plants and trees which breathe in the CO2 and put it into that carbohydrate structure. And then we collect it put it through a reactor, which is basically a large pizza oven that heats it without oxygen. That process called pyrolysis pulls the water out of the carbohydrates, leaving behind an ar aromatic carbon structure that is essentially charcoal. Um, it actually meets the definition of charcoal. We can take that charcoal and then we can bury it underground in anoxic pits, things like abandoned coal mines, right back where it came from, or abandoned pits and quarries, or even landfills uh, where there are co-benefits present. When you look at permanent burial technologies or permanent carbon dioxide removal technologies, the exciting thing about what 
solid carbon burial, what we're doing is that it has an expected storage time of thousands, if not millions of years, and it has a very low risk of reversal, so a very low risk that CO2 is going to come back out. Um, whereas things like afforestation, reforestation, you know, will of course reverse when those things die. Now this is the only chemistry I'm going to show you, um, but if you think about permanent carbon dioxide removal, there's only really four ways that carbon stays permanently fixed. And we know that because we can look at what has stayed fixed for 300 million years ago, for 300 million years. And that's things at the top like coal, right, these highly aromatic carbon structures. Things like rocks, calcium carbonate, limestone. Things like carbon uh, dioxide or, or gases, methane, underground in geologic storages and also oil underground, which all came from algae and is a slightly different structure. What's really exciting about what we're doing is the cost and the energy difference. And so anytime I look at a carbon removal technology, I want to look at, is it permanent? Does it have a chance of reversal? What's the energy cost? And then what's the monetary cost? Energy is important because we've produced all this CO2 in the pursuit of energy. So we need low energy approaches to remove the CO2. And cost, of course, to get widespread adoption. What I want to point out here is anything above 900 kilowatt hours per ton of CO2 removal doesn't make any sense because coal plants produce 900 kilowatt hours per ton of CO2 that they produce. So you'd be better off if, if you had a technology that used that much energy, you'd be better off using that renewable energy to offset coal than you would to power, for example, a DAC plant that uses 2,500 kilowatt hours per ton. You'd actually save three times more energy. So we have to be looking at energy in the equation when we're looking at how we remove CO2 because CO2 is an energy problem. The other exciting thing is that because plants are doing the hard work, they're paying the energy penalty to pull 400 ppm CO2 out of the air and, and purify it into a carbohydrate and upgrade it. We can build much smaller plants. We don't need to process all the air like these big fans do. And so we don't need a ton of capital. The government has poured three and a half billion dollars into these DAC hubs because these take a lot of capital to put up and they're also very expensive to run and they use a lot of energy. We're a fraction of that um, and we can scale this rapidly around the world. So we did publish uh, a paper in the last year that looked at uh, 10,000 different scenarios of doing this process and what we found was that the majority of the scenarios are very low cost and, and cost competitive. Um, so we can do this and we, we got the cover article of ACS Engineering, which was pretty exciting. This work has built on Paul's work back in 2016. <clears throat> These are cellulose molecules or a representation of them. And what he found was that at around 467 degrees Celsius, there's a critical kinetic transformation where you shift from just dehydration reactions or pulling water out of carbohydrates to carbon-carbon cracking reactions. And so that's the critical temperature that you want to stay below, and there's more implications of this as well, um, to maximize the yield of the solid char that you get. So we've built a reactor up and uh, it works fantastic. It's processing. Um, it, it will process 45 tons per day. They're portable, they're autothermal, so they run on, their own, the, on the heat of the biomass. And it's important too that, you know, we're using biomass waste, and I'll get to that in a second. To scale to billions of tons and, and save the planet, we would need to have hundreds of thousands of these reactors spread across the world, processing waste at those different sites, and then burying it underground. Um, but we can do this. This is uh, practical, albeit ambitious. <laughs> so the strategy is put these around the world. There's 40 billion tons estimated of biomass waste, which is more than enough to save the world twice over from a carbon removal standpoint. And these are waste sources, for example, like forest thinning operations that are happening in California to prevent wildfires. or 
uh, municipal trimming operations for utility lines or for residential. Uh, or in the case of the Twin Cities, we have emerald ash borer, which has wiped out all the ash trees and created a surplus of, of waste that has no other place to go. And they're piling it up and burning it or putting it in compost piles where it re-releases the CO2 in a matter of months to years. So there's enough waste out there. There's also cardboard. I have a lot of Amazon cardboard in my house. Um, and there's also algae and sargasm that we can use. Really any, or any carbon um, material can be py pyrolyzed or torrified into this solid carbon matrix. Uh, so a huge opportunity for us. That's me back when I had a huge ginger beard. And um, after I made a bunch, my first batch of a large batch of char. So in summary, what we can do is we can take biomass waste, we can torrify it or pyrolyze it, you know, basically put it in that pizza oven, and we can convert it to a charcoal. We can bury it underground and it can be stabilized for millions of years, just like coal. Many of you may not know the story of how coal formed, but 300 million years ago, there was a 60 million year period called the Carboniferous period. And that was when all the coal, pretty much all the coal, was formed. And that was because these large fern-like trees grew and they fell over and there were no microbes that could degrade the lignin. And so they just stayed there and they got buried and buried and buried and buried. There's just piles of these things. Um, I wish I had an artistic rendering of it. And what happened was at around 290 million years ago, a white rot fungus figured out how to break down lignin and coal production stopped because all those dead trees started to be broke down. So we need technology today to sort of emulate what happened back then during the Carboniferous period. And what was interesting about the Carboniferous period is it was 2000 ppm CO2 and because of all this sequestration of carbon over 60 million years, it went down to about 150 ppm and almost triggered an ice age. Um, so we want to do that, go from 420 down to 300, and we can do it. Um, so with that, I want to conclude. Uh, I want to say that, you know, the good news is we can do this. We have the technology, uh, and you guys can help. We need to switch to clean energy where possible. That's going to be hard for me. I love, I love using fossil fuels. I do. <laughs> I probably love gasoline than, more than anyone else in this room. I've studied it my entire life. I've looked at all thousands of different chemicals in there with my analytical company. Um, and it all came from algae. And it's just this um, wealth of chemical diversity. But we need to stop using it. We also need to use plants to remove CO2. It's the lowest energy approach to do this. Mineralization is also a great approach. And we need to bury it underground. Uh, we need to sequester it somewhere. The volumes are enormous. It's, again, the size of Lake Erie. No matter how you slice it, we need to take that and put it somewhere where it can't go back into the atmosphere. Um, it's a big problem, but it's 2023. We can do it. Uh, and then how you guys can help is to spread awareness and continue the pressure on corporations. There is a lot of momentum right now. Uh, especially with the SEC and the IRA and um, all these companies that have made net zero pledges are figuring out how they're going to do that. <laughs> and they have to do it because of the SEC's rules. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next 10 years. With that, I want to thank everyone for your attention. Um, I want to especially thank the Armstrong family, Lisa Schott, uh, the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, the organizers of this gala uh, who have done a fantastic job, all the scholars who are here uh, who are just starting their careers and at an incredibly exciting time. Uh, in many ways, I'm jealous of you guys and the opportunities you're going to have. Uh, I also want to thank my wife who's made a lot of sacrifices for me to be able to run two companies and She's in finance, so she can make the money, so I can waste the money. Uh, we call them dream dollars that I make. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and then my two kids. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old boy, and they, they are the joy of my life. So um, truly an honor to be up here uh, and 
just wonderful people to to see and to you know be in the presence of it's it's uh it's an amazing experience so thank you all for your attention uh have a good night